Hello and welcome to tonight's book reading session of Preparing for the Day After. Preparing for the Day After is a photojournalistic treatise on disaster mitigation published by me, Malini Shankar and Walter Keller for the 10th anniversary of the Asian tsunami. Tonight we will study the need for earthen material construction in post-COVID-19 era and the relevance of earthen material in the construction industry. Let us first recap what we have learnt in the previous book reading sessions before starting tonight's session. Water and sanitation, food and livelihood security have to be part of the development paradigm. Climate change adaptation, culture sensitive food security, menstrual hygiene products, sustainable solid waste management, Sustainable Development Goals, they are all factors to be included in the development agenda. Media personnel must be trained in scrutinizing common property resources to publicize disaster preparedness or the lack of it. Today we take a detailed look at the earth material in the construction industry. We will take a critical look at the unsustainable architecture and construction and the need to tailor construction industry to the needs of the post-COVID-19 era. Did you know that using earthen material in the construction industry gives us breathing walls with fresh air and circulation within four walls? Traditional architecture, like everything about any tradition, is all about conforming to agrometeorological conditions. That is why tradition never goes out of fashion. Today's talk will be a visual treat too. Let's take a look at traditional architecture. Now, here they are. Uh, the, there are many vignettes of uh, traditional architecture. They will be running in the background as I speak. Half timbered houses and rammed earth construction are, for example, prime examples of earthen material architecture. Unsustainable development has led to skewed environmental development in the past few decades. In an attempt to give value addition to marked up real estate prices, forests continue to be encroached, green cover has been decimated. Builders take pride in, in, in India at least in advertising how the flat owners will own a patch of forest at no additional cost. Indeed, the additional cost is human wildlife conflict for the future generations. Future generations will also be depleted of water table. The hidden cost of human wildlife conflict is manifesting everywhere without planned growth. The outgrown development outside of Luthien's Delhi is a manifestation of ugly, unplanned growth. Malat in Mumbai is the, another prime example. Gated communities outside Bangalore and Sikandrabad and Hyderabad are further examples. Chennai's very green suburbs of Tnagar and Desen Nagar are rapid encroachment of water bodies and mangrove ecosystems that align the coast. Decimation of forest cover everywhere in areas surrounding urban areas is a direct consequence of non-investment and non-industrialization in the rural heartland, but that is another topic for another day. Mumbai's Dharavi, Asia's largest slum, was the epicenter of COVID-19 during the first wave in 2020. Dharavi epitomizes urbanization unlike any other place perhaps on planet Earth. Lack of rural development, rural investment, sustainable development, employment opportunity have come together in one cluster, manifesting as lack of housing, sanitation and human development. There are scores of such clusters of concrete uprooting forest and green cover. At one stroke, it is the lack of India's development and the loot of the economy in the guise of a cash economy. The slums in Dharavi lack sanitation, ventilation and privacy. It is a sheer manifestation of all human rights violations and largely serves the purpose of political opportunism only. Yet the Dharavi population trudges on, on survival mode. The overpopulated and congested dwelling areas were the root of the COVID clusters. Indeed, the spread of various mutated variants from Dharavi has proven deadly. Dharavi has been the epicenter of COVID mutations and variants. Multi-storied buildings for dwelling places are unsustainable on so many counts. 
walls, floor and ceilings belong to the builder and only the space between the walls belong to the owner. To make the multi-terraced structures safe, its huge investments are made on pillars destroying green cover all around. Setbacks are violated to justify commercialization and corruption is of obviously a connivance factor. These multi-story terraced apartments lack cross ventilation and multiple toilets inside such structures means no fresh air for toilet. If you observe with a critical look, most of these commercial apartment constructions lack direct contact with the main road because most of the real estate or plots of land bought through a commercial transaction, in most cases without clear title, without tax paid receipts, etc. Thus, they lack access to main roads and arterial roads. In many places, cleared slum areas are illegally acquired by big builders. If slums were an encroachment by the poor homeless, the flats and apartments that come up there with political compliance and legal mismanagement, it is still an encroachment explained by these huge structures that lack access to main roads, municipal water supply and so on. The apartment owners are forced to pay for capital water supply and power supply. Tax payments are inclusive of maintenance money. No receipts, so they, these are blatantly illegal structures depleting common property resources like groundwater and green growth. All to favor claustrophobic urbanization. These multi-story structured housing decimates the trees in favor of mounded and landscaped lawns. While gardens are not exactly detested, the urban wildlife in the decimated trees definitely resent these new age commercialization with concrete. Arboreal creatures like bats, squirrels, monkeys, reptiles, and maybe even nocturnal creatures like slender loris. Even the mongoose in some areas will be infinitely traumatized by the destruction of their habitat. Culled flowering plants deprive bees and butterflies of their food. Given their fragile numbers in comparison to overpopulated urban pockets, it is the wildlife that are in smaller and marginal unsustainable numbers. And their right to live is not only really taken for granted by wanton destruction, but decimation of the environment depriving future generations of their bio and zoodiverse inheritance. The real estate race takes pride in encroaching forests. They even advertise their encroached properties as owning a patch of forest or wildlife habitat or a butterfly habitat and so on. They justify their enormous rates in doing so. Wildlife migration corridors have been thoughtlessly severed by the real estate agency. Underground water table has been decimated mercilessly without a thought spared to the replenishment of groundwater for the next generation. Time has come to call a halt to this. Some say this environmental callousness has triggered the pandemic. The concrete jungles have contributed emissions emanating from concrete construction. Financially speaking, the builders cut corners and compromise on quality. This shows up as leaking sanitation infrastructure barely a year or two after occupation. Builders do not compensate for the destruction of green cover decimated during or prior to construction. In the name of housing for all, the construction industry has ruined habitat for God's lesser creatures like urban wildlife and in the process heightened human-wildlife conflict in urban areas. Reptiles, birds, insects and arboreal mammals like squirrels, monkeys and slender lords are being persecuted. In any case, COVID-compatible real estate development calls for significant spacing between human beings. So COVID-compatible construction needs a lot of spaces to protect people from aerosol-borne infections in the COVID era. No room should accommodate more than three people at any particular time with a distance of a minimum of six feet between two human beings at all times. It is thus necessary to make every room at least 18 square feet in area. That seems impractical for multi-story apartment block housing. On a per capita basis, we need 15 to 20 square meters for one person. We need 35 to 45 square meters of green cover per head. And a per capita water, your water usage of no more than 45 to 60 liters per day. This is not feasible with concrete and steel construction in urban areas. Multi-story apartments hold five times the number of toilets per apartment on an average. The water consumption in these toilets are, at a conservative estimate, five to eight times more than an independent house. Without green cover, the apartment buildings cannot replenish groundwater table. Apart from depletion of groundwater table, salty borewell water can lead to kidney ailments in the long run for apartment residents. It cannot be overemphasized that spacing is required in the post-COVID era. One has to have spaces for kitchen gardens in the interest of self-reliance and sustainability. 
That means bylaws for setbacks have to be respected. The construction industry has to expand horizontally to include homeless people in the rural areas or hinterland. To be sustainable, usage of other material wherever possible makes it sustainable financially too. But cheaper construction needs to be undertaken. Other material like sandstone, nice rock, on-site soil, bamboo instead of steel, anything can be used for construction. Cob and battle with bamboo reed will serve the purpose too. Speaking to Digital Discourse Foundation, Atta Ur Rahman, founder of Kala Kutum in Bangalore, who has specialized in urban architecture, said, quote, Earthen or natural buildings by its very nature reflect local material, geology, skill, culture, and climatic conditions. Constructed by the community using traditional tools, these structures are highly pragmatic, efficient, and blend with the landscape. These buildings have all the attributes that we only seek in our modern houses, as the industry struggles to accommodate the demands and concerns in the day and age of climate change. Urban material housing and construction will rationalize the bubble economy and leverage resources, employment and housing for all with sustainability as the mantra. By using urban material like excavated soil for rammed earth construction, bottle and door, bamboo, laterite, cow dung, rice, husk, clay bricks or mud for wall construction, and minimal amount of cement or indigenous alternatives, the cost of construction will come down so drastically that it can then achieve housing for all. Further, by sustainably reusing and recycling class material, we can deal with waste materials too sustainably. Sustainable architecture in the COVID-19 era or the post-COVID-19 era must be single story and with 18 square meters on a per capita base. Usage of cement, cement must be minimal. Usage of cement must be minimal. Earthquake safe architectural code must be used and deployed wherever necessary. Secondly, urban architecture is cooling, neutralizing carbon emissions from cement concrete in the construction. Urban material construction can avoid usage of air conditioning completely. That helps one save a lot of money on air conditioning. Further, by discouraging use of air conditioning, we will be responsibly reducing carbon emissions, thus mitigating and adapting to climate change. By adopting stringently separation of waste, we can collect calorific value in discarded plastics. This can help in making construction material for highways. Organic, biodegradable litter, when effectively segregated, makes high calorie green manure or compost manure as well as help in restoring abandoned mine pits. Traditional mud houses, even in earthquake-prone areas like Kashmir, Gujarat, even in Tibet, Iran and Eastern Europe, have survived big earthquakes. Bamboo-supported architecture in Japan is a legend in earthquake-safe housing. Being prudent in consumption is a smart thing to do. Treated bamboo is an effective substitute for steel in construction, say specialists in bamboo architecture like Neela Manjunath and Parameshwaran Iyer, experts in bamboo construction in Bangalore. The tensile strength of treated bamboo for construction material won merit. And recently, the government of India has approved bamboo as construction material. The artificial fiscal bubble of profit in the construction industry will soon burst on its own. I will now quote from a release of Indian Plywood Industries Research and Training Institute in Bangalore. Quote, the National Housing and Habitat Policy has recognized that the housing sector is a medium to generate employment. Towards this end, the Government of India seeks to strengthen production activities of environment-friendly and cost-effective building materials. At the house, as the housing and the building construction industry is one of the largest consumers for natural mineral resources and forests, it is increasingly realized that innovative building materials and construction technologies which offer potential for environmental protection, employment generation, economy in construction and energy conservation need to be encouraged as best options to meet the rising demand of housing in different regions of the country." Unquote. Bamboo can be used as the foundation as trusses, scaffolding, as pillars for flooring, for roofing, for windows, for window beams and frames, as well as built-in furniture, shelves, and so on. Bamboo pillars can house cement concrete and can be an effective substitute for steel and cement pillars. Since the treated bamboo's tensile strength is natural, it can stretch and contract during earthquakes, helping absorb the natural seismic shock, according to experts. In my opinion, bamboo's elastic characteristics can make it earthquake safe in construction only 
if the construction is symmetrical with the center of gravity being in the center of the building. Indeed, bamboo is the new steel. Bamboo reed can serve as a skeletal frame of the construction. Bamboo fiber can be used as copper bottle for wall construction. Bamboo fiber in construction apparently acts as an insect repellent according to some online reports, but I will leave that to the experts to decide. COVID-19 compatible architecture calls for significant spacing, investment, uh, spacing requirements for the occupants at the rate of about 6 square feet distance between two individuals and a maximum of three persons can occupy one room at any given time. Successive governments have not invested in rural development, nor has there been a conducive policy to encourage or incentivize rural development. Gandhiji said, until India's villages develop, India will not modernize or develop. Apart from treated bamboo, high-calorie plastic waste, separated organic and biodegradable waste, we must also strive to reuse water wherever possible. Reused and recycled water may please be used for flush tanks and toilets. Lessons to be learned include, concretization has to make way for landscaping and live edges. This will help recharge a groundwater table but helps urban wildlife re-establish their homes for coexistence with human beings. Land use policy urgently needs legislation so that 33% of land is earmarked for forest cover without space for encroachment. 33% of land for forest cover is not negotiable. In urban areas, attempts must be made to create and sustain urban forestry. While the criticality of water and sanitation cannot be reiterated, emphasis also needs to be laid on more sustainable use of water in the flush tanks for toilets. Perhaps we need to have another whole new supply line infrastructure for reused water. One toilet may not has to be used at retake. One toilet has to be used by not more than three persons per day. Flush tanks have to be filled up with recycled or grey water. We need to frame policies and find sustainable ways of usage of water equitably. We need separate water supply infrastructure, one each for fresh potable water used minimally for primary usage. Recycled or grey water for secondary usage to flush toilets and possibly to wash cars is another best practice. Treated sewage water has to be used to water the plants like kitchen garden. Soapy water from tap drains has to feed flush tanks in toilets. This kind of an elaborate water supply infrastructure will help save fresh water. Policies and policy guidelines have to be made for bottled water to make way for equitable access and distribution of fresh water for all. Water security and water and sanitation are not negotiable. Effective separation of dry waste can be used for production of bitumen that can be used for infrastructure development like roads and highway construction. Effective solid waste management with segregation can lead to effective reuse of segregated waste. There is immense calorific value in segregated biodegradable waste. It can be used for production of energy as well as for restoration of abandoned mines and many other benefits. By conforming to traditional architecture, we gain financially. Industries across India must get incentives to treat wastewater and be permitted to commercial tra commercially transact and trade treated industrial recycled grey water. That is sustainable and a best practice. This is possible by way of reaping advantages from local climate friendly architecture, resources, economy, agronomy, human resources. We save on transportation material from far away and the architecture will conform to the geological profile and requisites of the area. The locally available construction material is the biggest money saver. Bamboo has the potential to revolutionize the construction industry. It can be harvested without fear or favor as it is a grass in terms of botanical nomenclature and is exempt from forest conservation laws since 1927. However, responsible harvesting of any resource calls for compensating and planning for its regrowth. Captive bamboo plantations are the ideal solution to providing bamboo as a raw material for the construction industry. Treating bamboo generates rural employment too. Thank you so much for tuning in. To more, uh, in the next episode, uh, we will be looking at post-COVID era transport systems and uh, don't forget to tune in for the live chat on Saturday 24th of April 2021 around 7.30 p.m. Indian time. Till then, take care, keep smiling. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for sharing, uh, for having a look at this video and I would be grateful if you can share this video in your circles. Thank you so much.